Dave, standing in front of his house. And he's holding two canvas bags. His shoulders are drooping. And the bags are kind of hanging by his knees. He could be on a stage. He, he could be playing Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. Those are groceries in the bags. And Dave is standing there on the sidewalk on this chilly winter afternoon, just home from work in the grocery store, looking as defeated as Willie Loman. And this is what he's thinking. He's thinking about something he read about or heard about, or, or maybe he saw it on TV, can't remember. But the gist of it is that there were some pre-industrialized people who were clearly wiser in the ways of the world than we are today, or the ways of illness, anyhow. He can't remember when or, or where these people lived. Maybe it was medieval Europe. Maybe it was sub-Saharan Africa, or perhaps pre-contact America. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter. The point is, these people who may or may not have lived in a medieval hamlet or a tropical jungle did this thing when someone got sick. I mean, really sick. We're not talking about the common cold here. We're not talking about trivial things like rhino viruses. Dave had no idea what they did if someone got a rhino virus. The people he was thinking of were not doing battle with the common cold. They were tackling one of those terrifying, contagious illnesses, like the plague or tuberculosis or hemorrhagic fever. One of those diseases where it all goes fine at first. Well, not fine. You, you feel a bit achy. And then a general malaise settles on you. And when you check, you find you're running a fever. Like everyone in Dave's house, for instance. And then right out of the blue, you start to fall apart for no apparent reason. You're covered in boils or you start sprouting bruises. And before you know it, you're on death's door. And the initial symptoms are exactly the same as the flu. If you have one, for all you know, you could be one cough away from developing the other. Now, probably, more than likely, Okay, almost certainly, almost certainly, no one inside Dave's house, the house he's standing in front of, looking like Willie Loman, probably, almost certainly, no one in that house has the black plague or <laughs> consumption. And no one was going to cough themselves into the grave or bleed out or expire in any way, but, but we're getting to the nub of the matter now. If they did have one of those things, and any cautious person had to acknowledge that there was at least a, a possibility of that. And if they did, it was possible that they could give him what they had. <laughs> Probably not. But scientifically speaking, taking emotion out of it, you couldn't say that for sure, could you? For example, fruit bats are the most likely reservoir for fever. You can read about that on the net. Dave did. <laughs> so let's start with this indisputable fact. There was plenty of fruit in the house. <laughs> For that matter, there was plenty of fruit in the bags by his feet. With the thought of that, Dave looked around furtively, just checking. Didn't believe he was going to be attacked by a fruit bat in the middle of the winter, in the middle of his neighborhood. I mean, it was unlikely. But you didn't have to be, what were Morley's exact words? What did she say? A uh, hysterical lunatic. <laughs> you didn't have to be a hysterical lunatic to imagine a scenario where bat-induced fever was, if not probable, at least possible. Imagine this. Imagine a bin of bananas sitting on some tropical dock somewhere at the edge of some swampy, bat-ridden banana plantation. <laughs> And imagine one of those disease-written, gigantic fruit bats, some cloaked, winged thing the size of a dog, and it just landed on the bananas, smacking its greedy vampire lips, and some of uh, that bat saliva just dropped onto the banana peel, like the very bananas that were ripening in the blue bowl on his kitchen cabinet. It was possible. Couldn't deny that. And if someone, say, his son 
picked up that banana and then didn't wash his hands properly after he peeled it, say. Say he peeled it and then he touched his face without washing, which wasn't so unlikely. It's not at all impossible. In fact, that part was probable. Okay, he shouldn't have wondered about that out loud. (laughs) Or he should have dropped it. But he felt it was important so they would be more careful about washing their hands. That was all, as he kept trying to explain. (laughs) And let's not forget, Sam was the first to get sick. (laughs) Anyway, back to those pre-industrial people and that pre-modern medical time. If someone from that community got sick, like Sam and Morley had, for instance, not with a cold, but lying in bed the way they were, listless and feverish and, and, and cranky, if that happened, what the townsfolk did was bring food to the sick person's hut or cottage or shelter, whatever it was they lived in, and, and left the food outside the door. like room service. (laughs) That's how Dave put it. It was just like room service. And then the villagers watched the basket of food to see if it disappeared from the doorway. But from a distance. They watched from a distance. The, The point was no one went in the sick hut. No one served the food. And if the food wasn't touched, if the sick person didn't come out of the hut and get the food themselves, then after a set period of time, Dave couldn't remember the exact number of days, but after the certain number of days or weeks, if no one retrieved the food, the villagers burned the hut. (laughs) Assuming that the person inside was lost. You had to admit there was wisdom in that. Morley didn't see it that way. (laughs) Though maybe if Dave hadn't been wearing a scarf around his face and rubber gloves when he explained it, maybe she wouldn't have been so upset. Come to think of it, she seemed to be as upset about the scarf and the gloves as anything. Anyway, as he tried to explain, if, if if you burn the hut and the people who are in it, who would clearly be dead anyway, You stop the plague or whatever it is in its tracks and no one else dies. You save everyone else in the house. I mean the village, he said. (laughs) Through the scarf. From the hallway. (laughs) Maybe if he had brought the supper tray into the room instead of setting it down in the hall and standing there by the doorway in his scarf and gloves, she wouldn't have been so emotional. Anyway, it was just, it was just, the point is that everybody was sick in Dave's house. In fact, everyone he knew seemed to be sick, and the whole city seemed to be sick, and he was the outlier. He was the one person standing between the flu and its near perfect record of infection. And for over a week, Dave had been waging a constant war to keep it that way, and he was getting neither Sympathy nor understanding from his sick wife. (laughs) Which wasn't making his battle any easier. Just a moment ago, walking up the street, that lady with the little dog walking towards him, she had been no more than, what, ten feet away when she sneezed? Ten feet. Barely enough time for Dave to change his breathing pattern with a quick inhalation so he was on the exhale as he walked by her. Couldn't let your guard down for a moment. Not for a moment. It was exhausting. And in the middle of it all, he had to open his store every day. And of course, you inevitably mess up. Not necessarily uh, touching people, but you touch their things. And he tried to wash his hands whenever it happened, but you slip up. Like the other afternoon, Terrence, the mailman, he, he needed Dave to sign for, I forget what it was, a registered letter or something, and then the phone rang right after Dave signed for the letter. But before he had a chance to rinse his hands, it was the phone that distracted him. And it was Morley. And it was while he was talking to her that Terrence left, and before Dave knew it, he was holding the phone with one hand, and he was trying to dig something out of his eye with the other, which was the same hand he had used to hold Terrence's pen. He decided the best thing to do would be to flush his eyes. 
Unfortunately, the only antiseptic he could find was a bottle of mouthwash. <laughs> if, if you hadn't phoned, he said to Morley from the emergency department, <laughs> where he was having his eyes irrigated, this wouldn't have happened. You phoned at exactly the wrong moment. And on he soldiered for an entire week, cooking and cleaning, worrying and wondering. A little collection of remedies under the counter at work, a bottle of zinc, some vitamin C, echinacea, and elderberry extract. He knew most of them had been shown to be of marginal, if no, benefit. But you could never be sure. He dosed himself according to the instructions on the bottles. Well, okay, slightly more than the instructions. <laughs> At least he was doing something. It snowed on the Friday. Not the storm of the century, but hard enough to get the weather channel's attention. Enough snow that there weren't a lot of people out and about. And by the end of the day, enough snow had fallen that rush hour was a mess. Dave closed his record store early, stopped at the grocery store on the way home. And then when he got home, he stood in front of his house, the grocery bags hanging by his knees, looking as morose as Willie Loman. After he stood there for a moment, he carried the bags onto the porch and set them down by the door, and he shoveled the walk. He was about to go in and fix supper when he saw an upstairs light snap off at the Turlingtons. Both Mary and Bert were as sick as Morley, maybe worse. And so he sighed, and he took a shovel, and he shoveled the Turlingtons walk, too, and their drive. And when he had finished that, he did Jim Schofield's. Jim has a corner house. So it was like doing two houses. Actually, more like doing four. The walk, the driveway, and the sidewalk all around. So Dave was cold and wet and exhausted when he finally went inside. Sam was on the couch in his pajamas watching Brady Bunch reruns. It's the Tattletale episode, said Sam. Season two, episode 10, said Dave, that little rat Cindy. <laughs> Morley was still upstairs, still in bed. Dave made soup for Morley. Sam, who seemed to be rallying, asked for spaghetti. Phone rang. It was Jim. Thanks for doing the walk, said Jim. And then he said, do you mind? There's one more thing. And so Dave put his coat back on, and he trudged out. Jim needed something from the drugstore. I'm having a James Bond festival, said Jim, when Dave delivered his meds. I'm on number seven. Diamonds are forever, 1971, said Dave. Connery's last. <laughs> Second to last, said Jim. Dave threw Jim the little bag of medicine. <laughs> Didn't want to get too close. He was trying to keep his breathing shallow. He was <laughs> being careful. He was also exhausted, starving. When he got home, he finished the rest of Sam's spaghetti right out of the pot. Then he went upstairs to see if Morley needed anything. She was lying on her bed surrounded by magazines, real simple, the walrus, a pile of New Yorkers. And that moment, right then, staring at his wife surrounded by magazines, that moment is when it occurred to Dave that everyone else's life seemed a lot better than his. Everyone with the flu, that is. <laughs> sometimes when you try to walk to the beat of a different drummer, sometimes when you are the only soldier in step, you end up getting stepped on. Sometimes the rhythm of the many is the best rhythm of all, no matter what drum the many are marching to. He had lasted so long. He had fought so valiantly. He'd been so careful, it was hard to believe he succumbed so fast. 
but he did. <laughs> Came over him on Monday morning, suddenly and seemingly out of the blue, a terrible case of the flu, absolutely miserable. Luckily, without the aches or fever, <laughs> or sniffles, or anything really that was plaguing everyone else, though he shared many of their other symptoms. For instance, he found himself unable to get out of bed, or cook, or take out the garbage, and the thought of shoveling snow made him feel positively ill, as did the idea of unloading the dishwasher. Luckily, the day before he was so surprisingly laid low, he stocked up on bagels and chips and a stack of movies he'd be meaning to watch. <laughs> exactly two days' worth. And coincidentally, two days was precisely the number of days it took for the flu to move through him. When he did emerge, he did look surprisingly rested and rosy, no doubt a result of his carefully cared for and highly tuned immune system. And the two days in bed. And the bagels, of course. Someone should do a study on Montreal bagels. I'm not saying that's what saved him. I'm just saying he seemed to bounce back a lot faster than anyone else. 